Mag ik weer jullie aandacht? May I have your attention, please, for uh, Dirk Jan Ochtman. He will uh, talk about nano messaging. Uh, I want to mention that uh, Kyle Vos will later this day uh, uh, go into zero MQ. Uh, I guess you will mention it. Uh, I will mention some, it yeah. a few times. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dirk Jan Ochtman. I am a software engineer. I work at Kenside by day, which is a financial asset management startup, and we use your MQ a bit there, which is when I got interested. I also work on a few other open source projects, which I've listed here, and I've started contributing to NanoMessage. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronou pronouncing it like it right. We are at 0.1 alpha, so we don't have an official pronunciation policy yet. Um, like Joachim, I want to see, I figure you have a lot of networking experience here, so I suppose everyone's experience with TCP IP and knows what that's about. Um, I was wondering if people had worked with message queues, anything like ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ or BeanstalkD or whatever. No? Anyone? A few people? Okay. And then there's 0MQ, uh, which NanoMessage is kind of the successor to. And has anyone worked that? Who had? But no, not many others. Okay, so I hope I'll be, in, be able to enlighten you a bit about what's cool about 0MQ and NanoMessage. Uh, I wanted to start off with a little bit of history. Um, of course, we started with just uh, TCP IP which is basically the sockets API, you have one side of the stream and another side and you send data in and you get data out. And it's kind of a continuous stream of bytes, uh, which is great as a primitive, but it's also kind of a pain if you want to do something slightly more complex. If you want to pass messages, you have to start deline delineating the messages by <coughs> using, say, a message length prefix and then read until the end of the message, but sometimes you get half a message or you get two and a half messages at once and you have to figure out how to split those up and work them correctly. Um, also, it's pretty tight into the uh, network topology, so you're working against usually either a domain name, which is a slight abstraction, but also just an IP address with a port, so you have to figure out how to connect to that. And uh, sometimes in larger systems, in distributed systems, uh, they can be split all over uh, larger networks, crossing administrative boundaries, and you might want something slightly more, sl slightly higher level of, of abstraction, so that you have to have you have fewer things to take care of in your own code, say. So uh, you might use a queue abstraction, and there's a bunch of advantages in that. Um, first is that you can send messages asynchronously. So uh, some process can put some message into a queue, and then some other process can pick it up later, and they don't have to be connected at the same time, which is good in some cases. Um, the queue can make sure uh, can do things like, like rate limiting or uh, making sure there's some extra reliability to make sure messages get delivered. Um, it can also abstract away from the network. Uh, maybe some processes move to another server or whatever. And uh, it can take care of that. And one other thing they can do is multicasting. So for example, if you want to have one message and you want to send it to a bunch of recipients, then you can do something more efficient than just putting out X copies of the message into the network. Um, so there were a bunch of queuing message queues. It was pretty widespread. Uh, I guess it still might be. Um, there's things like WebSphere, which, which is a big one, and the other ones I mentioned before, like ActiveMQ and RabbitMQ. And at some point, they started or at least a bunch of the open source queues started standardizing on a 
uh, a protocol called AMQP. I think it's the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol, or something very inspired like that. Um, and this is kind of where we get into zero and Q, because uh, some guys uh, who worked on AMQP got interested in doing multicasting over over uh, on a message queuing system. And Martin Sustrich, um I think he lives in Slovakia now. I'm not sure actually where he's from Eastern Europe. Um, and he was working on this, and he found it is interesting to see if he could match kind of the queuing uh, abstraction, queuing semantics with a simple API, because the APIs were generally somewhat harder to work with than the simple sockets API that you might be used to if you work on a simple network program. Um, so he got kind of into that, and it took a while to get it to completion. But at that point, you get something which you call zero MQ, which is the idea of having a message queue without the actual broker kind of big thing in between. And you could just have the simple API and build simple queuing-like systems uh, that are distributed over a larger network. And I guess this is a good time to say something about the differences between uh, zero MQ and nano message. Um, Nano message really is a kind of successor. Uh, Martin wrote Zero and Q first. He uh, built it with a few other guys. Um, at some point, uh, Zero and Q turned out to be very complex, and it did had a lot of complexity that he thought wouldn't be needed if he built it all over again. He also built in C++, uh, which worked okay, but turned out to have some problems as well. And he decided to start over. Uh, at first, he, he actually forked 0MQ into a project called Crossroads IO. Uh, likely, you, ha you haven't heard of it. Um, but then he started, really, he really started over with Nano Message, started from scratch, kind of, and uh, with a clean slate. Crossroads is actually uh, in Ubuntu. Is it used there? Uh, I use it, but, okay. uh, but because you, can, you can very easily install it. Yeah, and it's. Yeah. I would not advise people to use it because it's not being maintained there. I mean, it's out, outdated already. One release and no one cares for it anymore. There's an occasional post on the main list, and I just tell them to yeah. go away and go either use their own queue or an message at this point. Um, so I wanted to take you through uh, some of the Patterns. Uh, patterns are kind of the core in, in nano message in zero MQ. You have patterns uh, that allow you to do some of the some of the recurring patterns in, in networking in queuing systems um, that you want to do, and it allows you to build them really easily. So you can take a lot of complexity out of your code and just use the library to build that kind of stuff. And then in between talking about the patterns themselves, I'll also show some of the other features that are core parts of nano message. So here is, I hope, can everyone still read this in the back? Some can and some cannot. Um, I can give you the, the URL for my slides at the end so you can review the code. Um, so I've chosen to show Python code here. This is using a very small uh, binding, <coughs> language binding for nano message. It's actually kind of cool because there's only been a 0 0.1 release and there's like 9 or 10 languages already supported. There's a big community. This one I wrote myself. Uh, it's, it's just, I think it's 100 lines of code or something. Or something. Uh, so this is the first pattern. It's called the pair pattern. Uh, so you have a, two sockets basically. And they both use the pair role, uh, so it's just a, it's just a, an integer, just a constant, but it denotes using a role <coughs> in, in the participating in the in the communication, and we bind or connect them to an in-process uh, messaging transport. So nano message supports a number of transport mechanisms, 
and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. And then we have uh, process one, uh, send two messages. Process two can receive a message. Process two can send a message. Process one and process two can both receive messages and you see that it kind of all works out. Um, and you can see that you can kind of inter interleave receive and send calls here. And that's because there are just two parts of the, just two uh, participators in the, in the system. So they know uh, where to send their messages and where to receive their messages. And uh, there's no extra things you have to be mindful of. So moving on, this is what's needed to make it work inter-process. So instead of the, using the in-process communication transfer mechanism, I use inter-process connect. And uh, in this case, it's using Unix sockets. So I just give it a pair or a path to some random path on, the, on disk. And it's used Unix sockets to communicate. So it's just a two-line change. And now, you're, now you can split both uh, processes out from the same, or both sockets out from the same process. And that's where you get this. So I basically split, it's still the same lines of code, but everything about P1 is now on the left and everything about P2 is on the right. And because, and it still works the same way because it's the same code. And then a message takes care of everything for you. Um, we can do that again and use TCP. And it's the same thing. Instead of passing it a path to a Unix socket, we pass it a host name and a port name. Um, you can actually use an asterisk uh, when you're binding, so that you bind to the same port on all the interfaces in the machine. That, that's useful sometimes. Uh, I think there's even some trick in a uh, message where you can pick and choose the interface without having to know the IP address uh, used on the interface at the moment. But I haven't actually used that much. Um, so moving on to the next pattern, uh, it's called request reply. I tend to think of it as response, but it's actually reply and it uses the REP, so it has to be reply. Um, so again, you see basically the same code. This is kind of the common thing. Uh, it's comparable with other client server architectures like HTTP. Uh, where you bind the re reply side to a socket and then you connect the request side to the same socket. And then the request side sends a message, the reply side receives, the reply side can respond, and the request side receives the response. And in this case, um, there's a little more state going on, so the reply side can only send a message after it receives a request, so it's always responding to a request. Uh, and that gets important because uh, in this case you also can uh, connect the same request side or reply side to multiple uh, sockets of the other type. So if I have multiple servers, multiple reply sides, I can connect the request side to all of them and it will do round robin across all the servers so you can kind of trivially load balance over all the uh, server processes. And there's another trick because uh, you can, where in HTTP, for example, you always bind the server to a, to a stable port, like port 80. In NanoMessage, you can choose to transport and enroll separately from the bind versus connect. So in this case, we can have the request side bind to some stable address, and have the reply side connect to uh, to the request side instead of vice versa. And that may be useful if you are, for example, working on some job queue, and you want the jobs on the request side, and it serves them out to the reply side, and then the reply side can respond to a job with the result from the job. And it's more, it's easier to do this way than the other way around because you can connect. Uh, uh, the reply side, you connect more replies processes to the same request process. 
Um, and one way I use that is um, I have at work, for example, I have a couple processes where that have a bunch of internal stuff going on, and I, w I would like to control the stuff that's going on inside the process. And I find it really useful to kind of stick a little uh, zero and queuing. In the, I'm using zero and queue there, but it works the same way with nano message. Uh, you stick kind of a reply socket in the side, and that gives you a really easy way to just have create a kind of control protocol. So here I have a little server, and it just loops over messages receiving on the reply side. It takes some kind of action based on what's in the message. And it sends a response, and you can have the client do the same, or the converse, actually. Uh, and that way, you can kind of control your server, and uh, that's much easier than if you would write all the TCP low-level stuff yourself, uh, and had to define more of the protocol to make it work. And with this way, it's very easy to build. So that's kind of what that looks like. Um, I use uh, the publish socket a lot, which I'm talking about next. And then there's a little reply socket on the side, which the request clients can uh, <coughs> connect to. So this is a publish subscribe uh, pair, uh, or pattern. Um, I think that's one of the most powerful ones, or I, I really like using it because it seems useful to me. Uh, you might have heard of Club Sub Hubbub, for example, which is a system for notifying feed readers uh, when an update comes out of your feed. Or you might have used uh, similar functionality in Jabber or XMPP, um, which also relies on that kind of stuff. And the thing here is that uh, a pl publisher just kind of sends out a stream of messages it can only send, and then the subscriber can subscribe either to all of the messages or to a subset of the messages. In this case, I have two subscribers, and the one subscriber subscribes to everything, and the second subscriber subscribes to messages that start with the letter W. And uh, it's, it's done with a prefix, so you kind of just check for the, the initial part of the message and then you filter on that. And actually the subscriptions are forwarded from the client to the server or from the subscriber to the publisher. So that uh, if your network transfer, for example, is expensive or slow, then you don't have to take, then you don't have to do that for any message that the subscriber doesn't want anyway. So in this case, you can see that the publisher sends two messages and the subscriber, uh, subscriber one will receive both of them but subscriber 2 will only receive the second message because it filters. And actually, at work, we use, uh, we get a lot of financial data from the market, and we use this to have uh, systems that can select, like, they subscribe only to parts of the stream. We have a big stream that gets, like, a few hundred messages per second. So it's maybe not that big, but big enough for us, and uh, it's really easy to process that in a published stream, and you can do more interesting stuff with it, we'll, which I'll show more about in a bit. Are you using a nano message in production yet? No, I am not. There's still zero in queue? Yes. Okay. Because, well, nano message is zero to one, as I said, it's really quite early, it works well in my testing. Uh, actually, I think the current master is quite a bit advanced from where 0 0.1 was, um, but I wouldn't bet the company on it just yet. Okay. So I'll take a little bit more time. Um, one of the other things that I like about NanoMessage is that it's really fast. Uh, this is just some number that has been proven to work on a Linux box. Um, Obviously, the kind of latencies you get might very much uh, vary with the operating system or your transport mechanism. But in many cases, you just don't have to worry about it because it's fast enough, unless you're doing really crazy scale uh, with it. How does it compare to zero and Q? It should be quite a bit faster. Well, that's what I thought, but uh, Martin doesn't tell anything about it. 
that's true because he probably doesn't have, hasn't done a lot of measuring yeah. yet. But there is also more abstraction in the nano message, so that could make it a bit slower. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, there is better extensibility, mm -hmm. but um, there's also a bunch of places where, for example, the use of C versus the use of standard library collections should make nano message faster. That's okay. That's what I was hoping. I, that should definitely be the case, and I bet if it's not, then there's a bug. Uh, but there really haven't. I had to dig through the mailing list to dig up this number, and I ran yeah. a few of my own tests. But this, I got, I think, uh, 10 milliseconds on this puny laptop doing publish subscribe things over GCP. Uh, so that's still pretty good in my book, but uh, this is better. Um, obviously, the operating system is a big deal there, and, and other circumstances will also vary a lot, of course. But it should be fast, and if it's not, then there's a bug, and you should file it. Okay. Um, next pattern is the push-pull pattern, or the pipeline pattern. So the idea is here that, uh, again, you have uh, a push side that can only send, and a pull side that can only receive messages. And because uh, the way this fits together is you can parallelize, parallelize every step of the every stage of the pipeline. So if there's some bottleneck, like for example, the middle part of your pipeline is slow, and you you can just shove in another process doing the same thing, connect to the same stable ports, and it'll just kind of work. And that's why I think Martin calls this pattern is calls them scalability protocols because you, they're usually an easy way to uh, create more scalability out of the system uh, by abstracting over different processes that might handle your messages and there's an interesting system called mongrel2 which you may have heard of which is a web server built on top of 0MQ and so there's like a central uh, worker, well not the worker, actually but a central daemon handling connections like uh, either in uh, Apache or Nginx, it works the same way I guess. And, uh, the website for this conference is running on Mongrel too. Ah, <laughs> nice. Uh, I think it's not actually being developed very much anymore so no. that's a pity. Uh, but um, so the way it works is that there is a push socket on the central daemon and it pushes out or the workers can connect to the push socket to receive requests and then the workers uh, publish uh, to the subscription socket from the central daemon and again here you can just plug in more workers by having them connect to the central daemon uh, if, it's, if your system is getting too slow. Another nice feature is that you can do routing in the central daemon so that some workers handle some kinds of requests and other workers handle other kinds of requests. And you can also have workers in any kind of programming language. So for example, you can easily use some Ruby workers and some Python workers and some PHP workers, all from, this, from the same web server, serving up with different stuff, which is useful in some scenarios, okay, I guess. Uh, there's one more thing, which is called the device, and the device is basically uh, <coughs> a way in nano message or zero MQ to uh, connect two sockets together without interference from your user level code. So here, for example, I've taken two subscription sockets into pull sockets, uh, all sockets that read or, or receive actually, and they're connected to a single pub socket, a published socket, and every message coming in on the read and receive side will also be sent out on the publish side. So you can imagine that if you have some kind of uh, larger system, like with the scalable worker processes or whatever, then this is a way you can bring everything together again into a single feed, um, which is very useful and which I'll also show in my more advanced example, which should be coming up next. There we are. Um, so this is what we've been doing at work, um, where uh, at the top um, at the root is a kind of daemon gathering up market data from 
I, I think we have about 40 exchanges at this point. Um, at the side, there's one of these little control channels uh, with the wrap socket sticking out. And then it sends out data on the, on a publish socket. And that's received by three separate demons, at least. I don't think this is a full system at this point, but I can hardly keep track. Um, two of which use the data we, we get from the, from the broker or from the exchanges to synthesize more data. So this leftmost might take some markets and synthesize them into derived data for other markets. Uh, the second one does the same. And the third one is just a counter, basically. It counts how many messages come in per minute, say. And then it publishes that information on yet another reply socket. So we can easily query, query that from, uh, from prompt scripts, for example, prompt app. So we can keep track of what's happening there. Um, and then the synthes synthesized data and the orig original data gets aggregated together again. Uh, by a device, uh, and we have a process uh, updating or keeping a current update, currently updated state of all the data in Redis, say, or some other data store that you might use. So we now have a, a single feed again, uh, which is used by a bunch of other subscribers um, to do the actual work we need done. But it was really easy to splice in extra demons to build extra data and generate it all into a big feed again, which is easy to handle. So I guess that wraps up most of what I have to say about this stuff. Um, but finally, I want to touch a little bit more on the differences between ZeroMQ and NanoMessage. Um, and also the future roadmap for nanomessage. Um, so these are some of the main things that are different in nanomessage. The API is uh, more like POSIX or our BSD sockets, um, which is nice. Um, it's also great because you can use the same API on all main, all big platforms. Like uh, it works on Windows, OS X, and Linux. Uh, some guy was even trying to come up violate on HP UX, and I think he got that somewhat working, but there's still work to be done. Um, so basically it works every, the same everywhere. Um, on Windows it uses IOCP, so it's pretty fast and scalable. Um, one other difference is that the license, uh, I think ZeroMQ was under the lesser GPL, uh, which is okay in my book, but created problems for some other people. And this is under MIT license, so you can basically do whatever you want with it and without getting sued, which is always good. Um, it's written in C, like I said. C++ is, is okay, um, but C has... Well, Martin has written a few blog posts about why it's in C instead of C++, so if you're interested in that, you can read more about that. This whole list of differences is also on the NanoMessage website, which is nanomessage.org if you're interested. Um, so it should be faster because of using C. It's also a lot easier to build language bindings in C than in C++ because you can generate stuff without having to take care of C++ name mangling, which depends on the compiler and whatever. It's kind of a pain. Uh, but with C, it's really easy. Uh, like for my Python bindings, I kind of just parse the C and then generate the constants. And it's really, there are good tools to do this uh, in for many languages, so you can build extensions. NanoMessage is also pretty extensible. It's built so that transports are mostly pluggable. Uh, and the same thing for the patterns, so you can uh, somewhat more easily, at least than in zero MQ, add a new pattern. And there's actually a few patterns already in there that I haven't shown here yet because I'm not that familiar <coughs> with them and the presentation would get too long. But if you're interested in, I think there's a bus pattern, there's a surveyor pattern, which is kind of like a voting or quorum protocol. Um, and more are being discussed, actually. So 
Yes. Uh, I'm wondering where a uh, router dealer went because uh, the, that ah, comparison yes. page it says that uh, you're supposed to use uh, lower level protocols for it. But I'm currently yeah. making an async request reply server in zero MQ, mm -hmm. and you need router dealer for that. Is, is that in request reply in nano message or? So. I forget what router dealer do exactly. It's uh, it's async uh, request reply. Request reply is actually built on top of router dealer. So let's go back to request reply. Somewhere in here. <laughs> this one. Yeah. So well, once once you have sent a reply, uh, you must. Re receive it, and yeah, once you've uh, received the request, you must send the reply mm -hmm. before you do anything else. Yeah. And if the reply gets lost, uh, the pattern gets stuck. <coughs> and uh, I understand that in nano message it doesn't get stuck anymore, so that's good. Mm -hmm. But how do I make this async? Because that's done with router dealer in zero MQ. So. I don't know about router dealer, but what I do know is that nano message has, like, if you see here the socket uh, arguments, it has first an address family and then the socket type. And there is another address family in there, which is called AF raw SP. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you can use to simulate something like router dealer because it will take the whole message including any framing done by nano message and use that instead of just the parts of the message that are sent in by the user layer. So I think that will take care of those problems, but I'm not quite sure. You you know, should probably that, that, that would get you access to the, the message structure, but um, how, how do you get out of the request reply lock set? I'm not sure. You should ask the mailing list. Is there is there an example for a nano message for an async router? I am not aware of any examples mm -hmm. like that. But either you try IRC or the mailing list. It sounds a bit scary, but let's see. <laughs> it's I found nano message to be less scary than zero MQ, uh -huh. um, even if it's just because. Uh, in the zero MQ project, like the, the way the mailing list functions, at least when I participated in it, it was also not quite your average open source project. There was a bit more control exerted or over the whole project, and that was, I guess, one of the reasons it got forked at one point. <coughs> and nano message is much closer to the kind of open source project I'm used to dealing with, which yeah. is usually nice and friendly and based about the code or basically run the code. Let's see. Uh, right, so that was extensibility, I guess. And, well, there's a bunch more stuff. The threading model has been overhauled compared to zero MQ. Um, in zero MQ, there was a single thread for every socket, I think, or even for every uh, connection. So if a socket was connected to multiple other sockets, then there would be a number of threads for that. And in nano message, there are much, or the threads get lo get allocated to the sockets as necessary. So it's much more flexible. Um, and also, this should be good for performance. I think that's really it. So if there's any more questions, uh, let's have them. Nothing? Okay. Thank you. We will now uh, move on to uh, Jan Meijers about uh, fossil and the residual mines. Please uh, get some coffee uh, meanwhile or water. Or, uh,